is the Army Hour. Official radio report of the War Department for the week of 26 March 1944. Here is the Army to bring you the sound of war from the four corners of the globe. Here speaks the Army. even to the front lines through motion pictures from Hollywood. Hickam Field in Hawaii is buzzing with activity today, and you'll witness the event shortly. A young veteran of battle is waiting to tell you his amazing story of combat. And standing by at the War Department in Washington is an officer of the General Staff with the official War Review of the Week. This is the Army Hour. day, over 800,000 American soldiers around the world will see a Hollywood movie. American movies go wherever our soldiers go, and sometimes the films get there almost as quickly as our fighting men. To tell you how this operates, here is Major John W. Hubble of the Army Pictorial Service of the Signal Corps. The film industry in Hollywood gives us the movies free. We ship mostly by air, 65 copies of three different movies weekly, to our 19 exchanges all over the world, India, Alaska, North Africa, the Southwest Pacific, to name a few. And each exchange then distributes the films to the troops by plane, boat, truck, jeep, anything that moves. On Bougainville, we had movies only 300 yards behind the front line. Thousands of troops gather almost nightly to see open-air movies in tropical New Guinea. Eleven soldiers huddled around a stove in a Quonset hut in lonely Alaska to see the same show. Movies are shown in the jungles, bomb craters, grass huts, tents, hospitals, mess halls, barracks, airplane hangars, and under starlit skies or in torrential downpours. I can report the troops are seeing most of the new movies. These pictures begin to circulate among the troops overseas at the same time they begin their showings in this country. For example, during the past two weeks, we shipped... Adventures of Mark Twain, Buffalo Bill, Meet the People. That shows the fine cooperation we are receiving from the film industry, which makes possible the showing of first-rate movies at all the fighting fronts. Thank you, Major Hubble. Now to visit some of those fronts and meet our troops stationed there. The Army Hour takes you now to North Africa. Here in the basement garage of a motor transportation company in North Africa, about 200 soldiers are seeing the movie The Miracle of Morgan's Creek. Some of the men are seated on long wooden benches. Many are sitting on improvised chairs. Others are standing with us here in the rear of this makeshift movie house. Beside me is Corporal Lawrence R. Tussey of Wayne, Michigan. Are you enjoying the show, Corporal? Oh, just well. Do you men work here in this same building? Yes. Most of us are drivers. We're subject to call at any time. So we fixed up this place where we could see our movies and be ready for duty at the same time. It's tough, though, to have to leave in the middle of a show. Now I know how doctors feel when they get paid to the theater. And uh, where do you live? 
We have that bunch over in the far corner of the garage. And our mess hall is right here. That makes it pretty convenient for you, doesn't it? Yeah, particularly when it's raining now. In warmer weather, though, we see our movies out of doors. We've been living our country's films ever since we moved in here. That's one of the first things most outfits arrange for when they move into new quarters for big wagon But well, you can tell from the crowd here tonight that these shows are really popular. They show sure are. You're lucky if you can get a seat. Team Staff Sergeant Paul Kingwall. Where's your home, Sergeant? Salt Lake City. Well, do you see as many movies here as you did back in Utah? Maybe more. We get them twice a week. But tell me, do you get much advance notice about what picture you're going to have? No, we don't know it until a few hours beforehand. But it doesn't seem to make much difference. How's that? It's all we're for good pictures. All of the men just show up every movie night more or less automatically. But tell me, what are some of the movies you've been seeing lately? Well, we've seen As Thousands Cheer, Higher and Higher. Yes, and a guy named Joe, and this is The Army. Those are pretty recent releases. Yes, I think we get them at the same time as we do back home. That's right. My girlfriend and I compare notes in our letters. We've seen a lot of the same shows at the same time. Yes, and sometimes we see them at the folks' cell phones. Well, you two seem to be a real movie fan. Well, all Americans like movies, and over here they're our chief form of amusement. They sure help take a guy's mind off his troubles. Well, thank you very much, Staff Sergeant Tingwell and Corporal Hussey. We don't want to keep you any longer from tonight's showing of The Miracle of Morgan's Creek. Now from North Africa, we cross the Mediterranean to take you to Italy. Here in Italy, it's Sunday night. We're speaking now from an Army Special Service Theater. It's a full house, 500 soldiers, American, British, Canadian, South French, are singing the song of Bernadette. With us is the manager of the theater, Lieutenant Richard Jones of Albany, New York. Dick, do you always have this large an audience? We certainly do. The soldier here is just like his folks back home. The movies are his chief entertainment. And the closer you come to the combat zone, the more likely you are to find the movies the only source of entertainment. But does the front line soldier really see the movies? You bet he does, before any other troops. Mobile truck units tour the areas up to within a mile or two behind the actual front, within artillery fire. When necessary, the show goes on outdoors with the screen hung from the body of a truck. But usually, the pictures are shown in an abandoned farmhouse, an old barn, or anything that's handy. Up at the Anzio Beachhead, they were showing the movie The More the Merrier, with King MacArthur and Joe McRae. In one scene, McRae apparently dropped something on the floor which made quite a noise. But the G.I.s watching the picture didn't hear it. So just then, a German shell exploded right outside the theater. King Arthur whirled to McRae and asked, what was that? Well, if the Jerry Shell had gotten a direct hit, it couldn't have brought down the house more completely. But well, what about the troops in the rear area? After the combat troops have seen the films, they go a little further back to the hospitals and rest camps and fire to the units in the rear, where the men usually dig up a regular movie house. How do the boys go for the pictures, Dick? That depends on the picture. What they want is entertainment. That's why they like comedies and musicals. And you can tell by the whistles that pinup girls are popular. They bring back memories of the girls back home. So what does the soldiers like? They don't care for cowboy pictures, and especially don't like corn. That means they don't care for every dramatic or gushy pieces. And they don't go for patriotic flag waivers. To the fighting soldiers, any glamorized picture about the army is just plain bunk. But just how much of a morale factor are these movies? It's still true, the biggest morale builder is pride and confidence in your army. But these movies do boost that morale. My men and I do this work after hours in addition to our regular duties. But we know it's worth the effort when we see the men appreciate the shows. To the G.I.s in Italy, it's like a two-hour photo home. And that's true in every theater of war, Lieutenant Jones. Now let's hear what these movies mean to G.I.s in the South Pacific. Come in, Private Flynn, in New Caledonia. Hello, Algiers. This is CFC Norman Flynn in New Caledonia. Just fine. Listen, Sergeant, you have your Emerson. Frank, I hear you people in the South Pacific are in on some small movies. Well, yeah, we've got some great ones lately. I don't know how you feel about it, but most guys down here don't like those for movie pictures. They like comedies, movies for historical and current events about them. The same thing in the Mediterranean area. And of course, everybody likes to see a pretty girl. I wish you could have been here last night. When Special Service had Coop Rosie O'Grady with Betty Grable, he went for it in a big way. 
You had any especially interesting suckers lately? We sure have, Waldo. You see, when the movies come to us here in the South Pacific, we make sure that the boys on Bougainville, Blue Georgia, and Guadalcanal see them first. Our latest star is everybody happy with Ted Lewis and Man Wynn. Man's a favorite. The gang's all here with Benny Goodman, Tommy Miranda, and Alice Faye. The miracles of Morgan Street with Betty Hutton and Eddie Bracken. That's a honey. You should have seen the gang well. You get many new pictures. Well, we're waiting for, for the song of Bernadette too, and we'd like to see some more like the Battle of Russia. We saw a movie in an open air theater, and we saw that one in the pouring rain. That's that's the way it works here in Algiers. We just got some new films too: Standing Room Only, Royal Canal Diaries, A Thousand's Cheer. We're looking forward to seeing the song of Bernadette, starring Jennifer Jones and Charles Dixon. Yes, sir, we're willing for that one. We enjoy comedy, music, and we're told that we have more humorous parts on the way. And that's fine, because we love them. Such as Walt's business, Mickey Mouse, and other cartoons. We do, too. There are a little bit of time that we can take wherever we go. So, well, time's up, man. See you in the newsroom. This is TLC Norman Flynn and the man New Caledonia. We're bringing the whole hour to New York. <laughs> of this war, something new, something very fine has just been added there. The Army Hour takes you now to Hickam Field, Hawaii. Our Army Hour microphone, and tell us briefly why you joined and how you feel about it. When war broke out, I thought that if there was ever to be an organization for women connected with the Army, I would be one of the first to join. I don't see why more women don't go into the WAC. Well, what about your training? After five years of secretarial work, which I gave up when I volunteered, I took my basic training at Fort Overfield, Georgia, then went to the Army Administration School in Denton, Texas. From there, I was assigned to the Air Transport Headquarters in Washington. I'd like to introduce Sergeant Rita Sutherland of Seattle. Go right ahead. Sergeant Sutherland not only holds her own pilot's license, but she is a licensed radio telephone operator and has earned the new certificate in celestial navigation. Sounds like you're pretty serious about your responsibility in your time. Flying is only a hobby. My real reason for joining the Army is to help get my family back home as quickly as possible. My husband is an American Red Cross field director overseas, and my daughter, Chloe, is a lieutenant in the West doing laboratory research work on malaria. I feel that the Women's Army Corps gives us a much better understanding of what our men and boys are going through and will benefit us for the important job of readjusting after we've won the war. I agree with you. This is Corporal Bob Bassani. Corporal Bassani does that. Marblehead, Massachusetts. I agree with Sergeant Sutherland. You see, I have a brother in the Eastern State. I have to admit that my reasons for volunteering are a combination of patriotism and curiosity. 
about the curiosity. Now, how does Hawaii look to you? Wonderful. Really more beautiful, and there's more going on than I ever dreamed of. Only I don't think I'll get to do much steam over here. Don't be too, uh, too sure about that, uh, Dr. Simon. Wait till you see our snow-capped volcanoes on the big island on your first five-day pass. And here is the captain of the Wack Company, Captain Audrey Hellenbeck of Bolton, California. Give me your attention for a moment. Your assignment is posted on the bulletin board. You are assigned to motor transport and power for duty and have been selected for the job for which you are best fitted. Are there any questions? All right. This is a day you've been waiting for since you first volunteered for overseas duty back in basic training. You're the first black company in the Central Pacific and you're assigned to the biggest air base in this theater. With a big job to do, let's do it. From time to time, the future given to Rochester, Massachusetts, arrived with the WAC. She didn't expect a torture call from Corporal Thomas given to Dorchester, but that's exactly what happened. It was a surprise, but then the past week has been so of surprises for us. It's been wonderful to see how cool the boys are to find someone in their hour outfit from their hometown. I think they're looking forward to Thriller, too, now that we're here. By the way, Corporal Gibbons came over for the broadcast today, and he's right here, too. Uh, how did you two get acquainted? I looked for the roster in the paper, and the uh, girls from Dorchester found one by the name of Gibbons. I said, what are we waiting for? Here's CFC Charles Dillon back of Chicago. He will be released by a private Patricia Gibbons. That's what they're telling me. For a long time, I wasn't too sold in the wife. But now that the time has come for me to go down south, I want to say good luck to you, Private Gibbons. A lot of us feel that way about the good luck. Frankly, I'm darn glad to see the Wags take over some of our jobs so we can move further out with AC3. Let's go, Staff Sergeant Roger Levinson of Bangor, Maine. From Hickam Field, Hawaii, where the Wags are on the job, the Army Hour will send you to New York. <laughs> Centers on infantrymen fighting their way through Casino and Anzio, Burma and Bougainville. Some may forget their gallant work in earlier engagements. Hill 609, Puna, Messina, Faid Pass, which made today's battles possible. To meet a fighting infantryman who will never forget one of those battles, the Army Hour takes you now to Walter Reed General Hospital in Washington. Here in Washington is a veteran of the Battle of Faid Pass, Lieutenant Marshal R. Davenport of Louisville, Kentucky. I'm getting pretty helped up about getting back to Louisville, too. It's been a long time. As soon as my artificial leg is finished here at Walter Reed and the plastic surgeons get through with me, I hope to get back there. Well, you seem to be getting around pretty well on the leg you're using now. And only fair. A British medical man in prison camp made it for me. But I broke it. You broke it? That's right. I was dancing on the grip zone coming over. I think we'd better get back to the beginning. When did you first see combat? In Tunisia, the Battle of Faid Pass. I was with the 1st Armored Division. We knew that Rommel was going to attack at Faid Pass, and we were out before dawn waiting for him. The Desert Fox was desperate. As it turned out, this was his last big push in Africa. Just at daylight, my company of tanks met a large force of Mark 6s. These are the tanks among the famous 88s, and they pack a mighty wallop. We tried in advance, but we were badly outnumbered in our particular sector, so we started to withdraw. The terrain was flat, a long valley. Just as my tank was coming about, an 88 pierced our armor. It broke open our ammunition cases, and in the flash, the whole inside of the tank was afire from the powder and oil on the floor. I knew I was burning to death. Then something happened inside the tank. I'll never know what. Something exploded and it saved my life. Well, how did the explosion save your life? By blowing me out of the tank. I was badly burned, and one of my legs was almost cut off. I lay there in the sun from 8 in the morning until 6 in the afternoon before anybody could get to me. Shells were exploding all around me. 
I thought every minute the next one would hit me. Between lapses of unconsciousness, I was cheering for our infantry. They put up a great fight, but finally they were forced back. Then the Germans picked me up. The sun was blazing hot, but I lost so much blood I was freezing. They covered me with blankets, loaded me in one of our own half tracks they had captured, and took me to a field station back of their lines. There, German doctors finished cutting off my leg. I stayed in Africa 13 days. Then they put me in a hospital ship and took me to Italy. How long did you stay there? Only until Italy surrendered. Then they moved us to Breslau, Germany. Captured British medical men ran the hospital there, and the Germans practiced a hands-off policy. The British were wonderful surgeons, and I got swell treatment. The artificial leg they made for me worked fine until I broke it. The Red Cross parcels, though, really saved our lives. Did you have any trouble making the Germans understand you? Not a bit. Every German officer I met spoke perfect English. It's part of his training for war. Jerry's a tough enemy. He's well-trained, he's determined, and his equipment is excellent. That makes the job of the infantry that much tougher. But we never doubt our doughboys. They're fighting for every inch they gain in the mud, rain, and snow. It's a dirty job, and it's far from finished. A lot of good men are never going to be able to see it all the way through. Some are coming back the way I did, to hospitals over here. Some aren't coming back at all. But if I know the dope boy, hell or high water, he'll come through. <laughs> Official Army Review of the Week. For the official review of the week, the Army Hour takes you to Washington to hear Lieutenant Colonel Albert L. Warner, Chief of the War Intelligence Division, Bureau of Public Relations, War Department. A Japanese drive across the Chindwin River developed this week into a threat to the town of Imphal on the plains of northeastern India. The units involved are comparatively small, but it is obvious that if the enemy objective were achieved, it would damage directly or indirectly Allied supply lines. British troops have reacted to the threat and have the advantage of air superiority. The decision lies ahead. In a land of hills and jungles such as those of Burma, it is not always apparent at once who is cutting whose supply line. In north-central Burma, in an area far behind the Japanese units headed toward Imphal, the enemy is having his own communication difficulties. Although the operations affected are not directly related to the activities on the Indian border, American infantrymen have showed again their jungle skill. They have flanked and pinned Japanese troops between themselves and Chinese forces advancing from the north. In the southwest Pacific, the campaign of encirclement nears completion. Emerald Island, north of Kavieng, was occupied without much difficulty. It is less than 600 miles south of the Jap base at Truk. Our bases now completely ring the Bismarck Sea. Our sea and air control goes unchallenged in this whole area, though there are many thousands of Jap troops isolated in various bases. In the period from January 1st to date, in the southwest Pacific, about three months, over 1,100 Jap planes have been destroyed. We have sunk or damaged 954 barges, and most of them have been sunk. We have destroyed 169 Jap ships and damaged 148. The aerial campaign this week against Germany made war industry in Berlin again a target. German night fighters, which staged a big running battle with the British, gave notice that the Nazi fighter force is not yet to be counted out. But the opposition to our American daylight attacks was not what it was once, whether that be due to the weather or a beginning of weakness in the enemy fighter force or a new policy of caution. 
the latest American attack on the Schweinfurt ball bearing works is an illustration of the necessity of repeated assault. No one attack totally destroys an industrial target, and in time a plant will be rebuilt. But constant bombing of a nation's industry and transportation will make the process of rebuilding at any one point slower and slower. As for the German fighter force, if it will come up to meet the challenge of the invaders, so much the better. But we shall not complain if it chooses to sit on the ground in the name of conservation and watches German industry crumpling under the aerial attack. The remarkable offensive of the Soviet armies has driven wedges into every sector of the German lines on the southern front in East Europe, and the wedges have broadened into frontal advances. These observations appear to be justified. The Nazi invaders throughout this whole region are back where they started in 1941. They may soon be relying upon the Carpathian Mountains for defense. They have had to commit additional troops in the rest of regions of the unhappy Balkans. They are faced with the possibility of a crisis in that area. But their forces in the east are still powerful and their organization intact. As to Italy, it should be frankly stated that the Germans have been able thus far to check the Allied drive in the casino area. Their guns in the hills, their stubborn position in the ruins of the town, their labyrinth of tunnels have held up the Allied force. In that casino area, along with the Germans, we have suffered casualties. The Nazis have been determined fighters. They have stood up against a superiority of Allied power. All those things are to be remembered, not with pessimism, but with soberness as operations on a large scale develop against Germany. Also to be remembered is the fact that our own infantrymen, living in snow and mud, constantly under fire, and during day after day the strain of combat, have met the test. From the War Department, the Army R returns to New York. so that NBC may bring you the address of Prime Minister Churchill, beginning in just a few minutes. Today we end two years, 104 weeks of reporting the most important story in the world, the progress of our army on battlefields around the globe. Next week, a special anniversary program begins our third year that will see us march forth with courage and confidence toward victory. Thank you.